Well, hello everyone. Hello, John. Hi, Paris. Hello. Um, my name is Paris Latka, and I'm with my friend and teacher, John Friend. And I'm a Bowspring student and practitioner for the last three years, and I've been working intimately with John. And I'm just so grateful for this opportunity to come together and ask some questions and get to know you more and share who it is that you are and the growth that growth that you've experienced with the world. Quite a quite a <laughs> task. Here. Yeah, I know, quite a task. Um, so, I'm, well, uh, questions. Oh, pulling out the questions. So I am curious if you could please briefly describe the essence of Radiant Heart that is practiced in the Bowspring, and where is it that you have the most challenge in your life maintaining it? Hmm. Okay, good question. So Radiant Heart is what we call and describe the alignment for the rib cage. And it connects into an inner attitude for our own heart. And when you think of radiant heart, you're envisioning an expansion from inside of light, of radiance, of fullness. So on a psychological uh, level, it is a feeling of an inner fullness of oneself where you're not feeling any lack, you're not feeling small about yourself. When we're in anxiety, when we're in fear, the heart contracts, the ribs even contract. Same thing for like if you're doubting yourself, you don't feel confident. You can apply it even to sadness. When we feel like we've lost something and we feel sad, we, we get small. So Radiant Heart is the opposite of that. It's an inner expansion of one's, really the soul, it's one's spirit. And there is, in this expansion, there is an optimism positive it's for growth it's for evolution I mean this is the highest feelings behind this instruction of expand radiant heart within your rib cage which you'll hear a lot in the Bowspring method so radiant heart is at the very essence of our method in the very middle of the body or the middle of the spine you can think of from the pelvic floor to the top of the head, the rib cage being right in the middle, and then right in the middle of the rib cage is this core of our self that we choose out of our own freedom, out of our own personal accountability to expand in all directions. So in the rib cage itself, it's not just that you're lifting your chest or opening the front of your heart, because when many, especially yoga students here, uh, open your heart, people do this, mm -hmm. you know, they take their hands back and they lift their chest. But in Radiant Heart, it's a three-dimensional, it's a circumferential expansion. So it's the sides, the back, and the front. And the whole rib cage is even light. It has a buoyancy to it. So instead of just expanding and feeling heavy, it's expanding and lifting up. So it's lifting up away from the earth. And this Radiant Heart is really the primary instruction in the Bowspring method that underlies all of the other instructions in our method. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So yeah. you speak to there being an emotional component to it, um, mm -hmm. a feeling of upliftment, a feeling of optimism. And so where in your life do you feel like you lose radiant heart in well, the emotional kind of realm that you're working to continue to grow and foster that radiance? Yeah, thank you. Well. It, at the most simple level, just being a, a guy, being a human, you know, anytime that there's, again, the, the stresses of life where, you know, I'm not sure about how something might go. I'm even doubting my own capacity. Um, the heart can get small, you know, to a certain extent. So, you know, I try to foster an inner courage in that case and, and keep my fullness not shrink back from adversity, not shrink back from the difficulties that, you know, that we normally have in life. Mm -hmm. So um, nothing, you know, particular, there's no, I don't have anything to tell you that there's a specific mm -hmm. incident um, or a specific event that makes my heart shrink. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the course of, you know, my almost my 60 years, I, I've lost some of the dearest people. My, Parents have passed away, 
I've had a lot of friends pass away in my lifetime. Um, heartbreak from losing relationships, breakups in intimate relationships. Um, all of these experiences, which we all have, I mm -hmm. think, you know, in the course of a life, it's natural to shrink. Mm -hmm. And instead of then staying there mm -hmm. and feeling like, well, you know, look how poor I am because this is all I've lost, I can return to the love mm -hmm. that was in those relationships. And in that love, I can expand. And so through gratitude, through appreciation, through these types of changing the emotion and changing the view of the of the, the, the situation even, I can go from shrinking to expansion, mm. you know, from dulling to radiance. Mm. But it takes conscientious um, effort on my part to really think this is what what is so positive, this is what I'm appreciative of, this is what I'm grateful for, and that, that can turn the whole thing around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Awesome. I'm really appreciating hearing the um, expression of, of grief and sadness calling us in, which is just yeah. natural, yeah. right? And this is a physiological response to it. And then from living that and feeling those feelings authentically, it's then this natural kind of emergence of of taking the lessons, applying them to life, and then feeling that radiance. And, and then what the Bowspring speaks of too is the pulse, mm -hmm. you know, and that being so a part of the pulse. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we do talk about pulsation both going in and out, mm -hmm. down and up, mm -hmm. you know. Um, forward and back. Forward and back. We have like a springiness in our postures. But fundamentally this in and out you know, that we're going to naturally have times of going in mm -hmm. and even shrinking and getting small, you know, just out of loss and pain, emotional pain. Um, and conversely, we can choose out of a higher meaningfulness to go a different way to say, you know what, I, I'm going to pick myself back up. Mm -hmm. I've fallen, I'm going to get back up. And that can come really from inside, deep inside the heart, not just in the head that says, um, you know, I have to do this, I have to go back to work, or I have to do this for my money, or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. but you're motivated from a higher level inside that's really dedicated to life, mm -hmm. that I want to get better, I want to evolve, I want to improve, and that's really what, it, it's this deep-seatedness in the core of the ribs even that we're putting in. And then it is a pulse. So we, you know, there's a time of rest even at night, you know, you just, we chill out. You might just shrink in front of the, in front of the screen or a TV or something if you really wanted to chill. But when we need to during the day, we come back out mm -hmm. and we're full on all sides. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's a pulse even to the day and the night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's my understanding that in 2012, when you were practicing at Vital, that your hip was bothering you and you were considering a hip replacement. Desi Springer, the woman who allowed this Bowspring practice to come through her body to share it with the world, had encouraged you to try the alignment of what was then called Sri Daiva. When it was, um, yes, Sri Daiva when it was just being born. And it's my understanding that you were pretty reluctant considering this was a completely different alignment system that you had been practicing and teaching and sharing with the world. So I'm wondering if you could please describe what was going on with your hip and how the bowspring influenced your healing process. Did you ever get a hip replacement? Like what, tell me yeah. about that. Okay, good. Well, first of all, to back up, I had been doing yoga since, I've been doing yoga since I was a teenager, you know, like 13 years old. So for many years, um, I had hip issues, like a psoas issue, um, in my, even my 15 years of teaching Anasara Yoga, um, I had many periods where I had a angry psoas, mm -hmm. you know, and that, it bothered my hip, and, but I, I did certain alignment, uh, my standard alignment that I used in Anasara, and it would, could get better temporarily, but it would come back, and by the time 2011, 2012, especially in the beginning, of that 2012, my hip was really bothering me uh, to the point where if I just try to walk 
hundred feet mm -hmm. or a couple hundred feet, I literally would have to stop, maybe move my hip, try to loosen up. It just was really painful. So I recognized that, and there was clicking and other sounds that indicated that I was wearing my hip. Mm -hmm. So I just felt like, yeah, I'm on a path toward a hip replacement. And in some uh, way, I rationalized thinking, well, I've been doing this yoga for so long, I've been active for so long, and this is just normal, mm -hmm. you know? Um, it's not Especially that was... because there's so many people, dancers, yogis, yeah. a lot of people who move their body that yeah. end up along that path. That's right, uh -huh. it's very common, you know, a lot of dancers especially, but I had always thought if it was only external rotation in the legs, you know, like a turnout, like mm -hmm. a first position in, bo in uh, ballet, yeah. That you you know you'd wear your hips out faster and that is you know what I've seen in the course of my career with uh, dancers so but I thought I had I was doing what I called inner spiral mm -hmm. and it would create a balance but it just wasn't working in the long run so Desi suggested that <clears throat> it wasn't just inner spiral and what I was doing afterward was adding on to an outer spiral which is effectively pulling my glutes down, tucking my tail, mm -hmm. in effect, to anchor my tail, and then stretch the spine up out of that. Um, she said, don't pull the tail down, don't pull your glutes down, literally lift your glutes up. And that instruction just seemed, you know, bizarre to me, totally. you know, like, how do you lift your <laughs> glutes, glutes you know, because I always, like, firm the glutes and uh -huh. you pull the glutes down, uh -huh. and that would stabilize the hips, and that would prevent, you know, laxity or dysplasia or any of that. Um, but she showed me and taught me that even through my feet, through my legs, I can activate my hips and change the alignment that the thigh bones could go back and widen, that my pelvis could tip and my glutes could go up. Mm -hmm. And when that, when I started to really get my glutes to work in this more direction, mm -hmm. uh, my psoas released mm -hmm. and it was really pretty fast, you know, like I did get relief literally within some days, wow. you know? I mean, it, even within a one or two sessions, there was some relief, so I knew, wow, this is really interesting. I didn't know why it would work, and it didn't seem to make sense to me, mm -hmm. because anterior tip of the pelvis, to me, only seemed out of balance, mm -hmm. and I taught the opposite for my whole career, because if, it, otherwise, if just an anterior tip of the pelvis, I thought, too much lordosis, too much curve in the back, you, you'll just compress your back. It's, it's, not gonna, it's not good for the hips. But the difference was with Desi's method was tip the pelvis but lift the glutes and in this anchoring, like a rooting, like a power, like you're gonna jump or spring, the whole low back would get, literally get linked. My psoas got more, got longer mm -hmm. and my hip felt, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it just get, it got better and better. And today, I mean, it's six years later, um, I, I don't have any issue. In fact, it's like more. I know. Yeah, yeah. Love hearing that. Yeah, yeah. it's really remarkable yeah. because now that as I'm approaching 60, um, you know, I actually my hips feel more aligned than I can ever remember because I always had in the course of my yoga practice and career, you know, kind of ongoing tweaks which would again temporarily clear but come back, mm -hmm. and I just I just kind of expected that to be normal. But I have not had anything like that. I haven't had any psoas mm -hmm. issue in now some years doing the bow spring. Mm -hmm. So that's remarkable. So my hips are more agile, I'm looser, I'm more open than ever, but I have more power. My glutes are way stronger. I can run and jump like never before too. So it's, and then, you know, having that experience with my hip, that was probably one of the main impetuses of really listening to Desi on her alignment and switching my whole mindset to a whole different model of alignment instead of the old standard alignment what I was doing with Anusara mm -hmm. to actually go a whole different way. Mm -hmm. It was really like antithetical 180. Mm -hmm. That must have turn. been that must have been really humbling. Like Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. like to be the not only uh, a teacher of a method, but a leader of a movement. And then, you know, when we're a leader of a movement, we're showing up in, um, I have something for you. Like, this is 
this is it. And then to realize that it's not it and it was actually maybe a cause of a lot of deep pain for you, physical pain, mm. and then to transition into a movement that was completely 180 and then uh, and then delivered to by a woman, <laughs> you know, like. Well, that was fine. Yeah, you know, that was fine. But you know, she yeah, but it is true. Uh, she's you know uh, much my junior. She was a student of mine before, mm -hmm. so kind of you know unconsciously uh, just putting uh, Desi at a level where maybe I didn't initially give her that much credence, mm -hmm. you know, and I thought I was certainly the expert. I had been doing it for so long. I had taught all over the place and I, you know, I had, it was my profession. So I charged people mm -hmm. money to give them an alignment that now I was starting to recognize was not exactly what I had thought. And I had previously for years with tremendous confidence um, and arrogance many times, mm -hmm. you know, uh, delivered to people in a way that this is the best, you know, this is mm -hmm. the magnificent alignment, and then recognizing that some of my even presumptions on the biomechanics were flat, really just off. Wow. And then having to really be humble and say, you know what, I need to stop and listen. And it really took me at least eight months, I could say eight months of even arguing with Desi because I just couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. It didn't seem, didn't seem possible really that uh, it could be so different. Mm -hmm. And now, now after six years, I recognize that the alignment that I was working with in a static neutral position for the spine, um, it, it can be, there can be balance. The bow spring is for dynamic neutral position, not a static neutral. And static neutral would be like if you just um, if you just rested yourself, like standing or sitting or lying down, your spine would take a very uh, gentle shape of gentle curves. Mm -hmm. But in a dynamic neutral, you're positioning where it's much more of a waveform on the back. And in this way, you're, we're able to engage the fascia, especially on the back, but on all sides of the joints, all sides of the body, more uniformly. So it's just really, they're two different alignment paradigms. They're two different models. They really, you can't really compare them directly. It's like one is good for resting in a way, and one is good for activity, functional movement, you see? So when I, when I got that understanding, then I was like, okay, so what I had been doing was only practicing and teaching the static neutral and it's just not for the long, it's not for long-term functional living. It well, really isn't. Because life is dynamic. It's dynamic right. and you, you do want your joints to have uniform tone. Mm -hmm. The fascia, you need to have a balance on all sides. And in static neutral, and you're trying, if you're moving more in that alignment, you'll invariably tighten the front of the body. So the psoas, you know, like for the hips as an example, mm -hmm. gets much tighter than your the glutes or the strength of it, the tightening on the front mm -hmm. of the whole fascial anterior uh, chain mm -hmm. gets tighter than the posterior. So you have this imbalance and this is really fundamentally what's, which causes the hip uh, you know, wear and tear. And that's fundamentally why as we get older, all of us, if the front is tighter than the back, we wear our hips out, you know, people get, today we get hip replacements, it's not, it's not uncommon. You know? Oh, it's, it's very, it's very common. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So this was the big thing and it changed and then it changed for, changed everything for me. Then mm -hmm. I started to look at the alignment differently and from then on I've been both spraying. And then in 2013 I asked Desi, you know, please let's work together, mm -hmm. let's partner up on this, let's, let's share it with the world, let's, mm -hmm. let's go on, let's go on the road and teach people and that's, that's what we've been doing. And so it's been ignited worldwide, yeah, yeah. which is really, really exciting. Yeah. Um, where is it uh, igniting the brightest, would you say? Gosh, well, we just came back from nine country tour in Europe. And mm -hmm. the Spaniards in several Spanish cities, it's blowing up. Mm -hmm. um, Germany, several German cities. Um, <clears throat> each culture in every nation, by the way, I think has a little bit different initial attraction to the practice. Like the Spaniards, 
they see the curvy shape mm -hmm. and for them it's expressive feminine it's lit Latina, mm -hmm. uh, freedom, mm -hmm. and artistic expression, they love it, the mm -hmm. women love it. There's not maybe the percentage of men, they're increasing, but it's relatively small. In Germany, there's more men that do it, mm -hmm. and they, I think, like it. All the Germans uh, will look at it much more uh, rationally in a way, that they understand there's a technique, there's a technology behind it, there's reason why it works, and they experience that it works. So they embrace it very quickly, and the men do it because they feel like, well, even though they might they think of themselves maybe as stiffer or tighter, they can do all the bow spring because they can bend their knees. They can they can use their strength to their advantage to align where they even have more power, more agility. So the German Germans love it. We we were in um, the in the Netherlands. They just opened a bow spring studio in Den Bosch. Um, in Denmark, there's it's all over Denmark. They just had a big Nordic yoga festival in which Bow Spring was uh, taught and by Christian. Um, so is that what Christians? No, no. and um, okay. the um, it was Christy Punnett from Barbados. Yes. Uh -huh. She was there and taught in Denmark at this Nordic festival, and they had about cool, 500, yeah, 550 people. Wow, yeah, um, so cool. And so many of them got exposed to the Bowspring. They had several Bowspring classes, very positive. Austria, yeah. is it's growing, um, and what's in the been, villages. What's been your response in the United States? The United States is, um, has been mixed because we have some, I think it's, it's smaller in small little studios, and it's spread out from coast to coast, but there's no, uh, in the United States, I think in some ways, there's been more pushback or more, um, it's not, because it's not the normal, popular, modern postural yoga, and it's, it's antithetical to the alignment that many yoga students, well, or pretty much all the yoga students are familiar with, and especially the yoga teachers who've gone through extensive yoga training, mm -hmm. teacher training here in the States, mm -hmm. um, I think it's it's just been challenging for them to embrace something so avant-garde, mm -hmm. you know? But I think that After it's- After so much has been invested. Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. and it's investment on every level. And mm -hmm. today, you know, and I've been in yoga again since uh, the 70s and just watched the whole thing, and it's, you know, it's a big economic, mm -hmm. um, situation where the industry of yoga is substantial so people have big financial investment they have studios and so on and um, there's just there's I think a tighter grip here in the United States to maintain that status quo mm -hmm. but then we have we have people like yourself and a lot of other teachers around the states that are kind of rebellious mm -hmm. and independent <laughs> and innovative and willing to try something new. So uh, I just think that it's funny because I think what will happen is as the popularity grows to a certain point, then more people say, oh, you see, it's more popular and they go. Mm -hmm. It's not because if something seems not so popular, they'll tend to have aversion towards sure, it. Sure. Doesn't right. matter if they think, oh, this is actually better, uh, oh, yeah. or you know, I had a good experience. If it's not popular, it's funny how mm -hmm. uh, you know a Western American culture mm -hmm. uh, will not always get behind it so much. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's still it's still growing, and um, I'm definitely yeah. feeling the momentum of it growing. Yeah. and people wanting yeah. it and. Well, just wanting to try something new. Like yeah. there's a lot of even just longtime yogis that I've been connecting with who have been practicing the bowspring and, and what has brought them into the door is like, I was just kind of getting bored yeah. with what, like, that's with, right. with, with, with the practice and mm -hmm. just wanting something a little bit new. So I yeah. think that's so exciting, all yeah. of the different ways that well, it's growing. And yeah, just watching globally. the last six mm -hmm. years here, let's say even in the States, um, more and more people are interested in how do I move? Mm -hmm. Functional movement, mm -hmm. uh, animal movements are much more, that's more in vogue, you know? Uh, curvy alignment, dynamic alignment. This is, more people have heard of this and more people are open to it now than ever before. So it's only growing from yeah. here. Yes, yeah. hallelujah, hallelujah.